Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our online worship service for Palm Sunday, the Sunday of the Passion, April 5th, 2020. We pray that the Holy Spirit will bless you and strengthen you in your faith as we listen together to God's Word and respond to Him with our prayers and praises. Let's begin our worship service with the procession of palms. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. Let us pray. Most merciful God, as the people of Jerusalem with palms in their hands, gather to greet your dear, dearly beloved Son when he came into his holy city. Grant that we may ever hail him as our King. And when he comes again, may we go forth to meet him with trusting and steadfast hearts and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 12th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went out to meet him was that they had heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that we are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us go forth in peace in the name of the Lord. Oh, 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Mercifully grant that we may follow the example of his great humility and patience and be made partakers of his resurrection. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let's share the peace of the Lord with one another. Whoever you're with today, share the peace of God, the peace of Christ with each other in your homes. Let's pray Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, oh, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord.
The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah, the 50th chapter. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Philippians, the second chapter. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Now the Gospel reading for the Sunday of the Passion, usually we have a longer reading that tells the whole story of the suffering and death of our Savior. And so it's, it's worthwhile for us to take some extra time and to have a longer Gospel reading and consider what Christ has done for us. Especially this year, I think we can all afford to take some extra time and to meditate upon the Word of God, the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 26th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. 
And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So, leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must be so? At that hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber, with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him 
and fled. Then those who had seized Jesus led him up to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you two are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Then when Jesus, when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? for he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. 
Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him, and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, and put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, 
who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. Next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that impostor said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest its disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is put away. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. Okay, I want all the children to gather around now because we're going to have a children's message. So whatever you're doing at home while you're watching this, I want you to put it aside for a minute and uh, listen up. Today we are celebrating Palm Sunday the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem and all the people were so excited to see him there, to greet him. And they took palm branches and they waved them in the air and they welcomed Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem as the king. And I wanna read you a story today and you can see on the cover of this book that it has a big crown. And so we know that it's about the story of King Jesus and it's called Only God Would Have Planned It That Way. You know, some of us are feeling kind of scared and uncertain about what's happening in the world right now with this pandemic that's going on, with all the sickness that's going on. But we have to remember that God is still in control. He still has his plan and he is in charge and he's going to carry things out in a way that he knows is best. So this is a story about what happened right after Palm Sunday during what we call Passion Week. It was the week of the, the, the last week before Jesus died on the cross. If I would have planned out the Lord's Passion Week, the throngs would be gathered and autographs they'd seek. And there you are. Wouldn't it be fun to ask Jesus for his autograph? But, the ficklish crowds would become a mad fray. You see, only God would have planned it that way. Later on in the week, the people became angry with Jesus and they wanted him to be crucified. If I would have planned how a conqueror would ride, I'd saddle a stallion with a big haughty stride. Did Jesus come into Jerusalem wearing armor? No, he didn't. He came in gentle and meek. Yet, he hopped upon a small colt that spring day. You see, only God would have planned it that way. And there's the people greeting him with their palm branches. If I would have planned the last meal that he'd eat, the best foods and guests would be placed at his feet. Yet Christ donned a towel and a meek servant's tray. You see, only God would have planned it that way. At that last meal with his disciples, Jesus washed his disciples' feet. 
If I would have planned how he'd spend his last night, I'd have thrown him a party to bring him delight. But he wept alone. In great sorrow he prayed. You see, only God would have planned it that way. And there we see Jesus praying alone in the Garden of Gethsemane while his disciples are sleeping. If I would have planned how a great king should die, he'd have a grand funeral and thousands would cry. But he hung on a cross on a day dark and gray. You see, only God would have planned it that way. If I would have planned the last statement he'd make, I'd bring in reporters and notes they would take. But it is finished were the last words he'd say. You see, only God would have planned it that way. If I would have planned God's great love plan for me, I would not have sent Christ to die on that tree. But God knew my sin needed infinite pay. You see, only God would have planned it that way. If I would have planned how Messiah would save, he would not spend three days closed up in the grave. But Christ rose from death that victorious day. You see, only God would have planned it that way. All right, let's finish with a prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you died for us, that you rose again on Easter morn. Thank you, God, for your great plan for our salvation. And we pray that you would carry out your plans in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, there certainly was a lot going on in those couple of chapters of Matthew that we heard just a moment ago. There certainly was a lot going on in Jesus' life in those last couple of days before he was crucified. There's a lot of interesting details in that story, but I'd like to focus today on just a couple of verses from Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 to 53. And these verses tell us some very interesting things about what happened when Jesus died. And so let's look at those verses. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. This, of course, is the climactic moment. The Messiah has been put to death by his own people. And so it describes then some remarkable things that happened at that very moment. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. These are kind of some very strange details. Sounds like some kind of a weird zombie movie. Matthew is the only one who records these things happening, but they were certainly very significant. There's many theories, of course, about what, where, how this all tied in with the expectations of the people. But I think that probably uh, Matthew was inspired by the Holy Spirit to refer to the prophecy that we looked at last week 
from Ezekiel chapter 37. Remember that, that story about the dry bones, right? That were brought to life, reassembled, well, reassembled first <laughs> into bodies, and then the Spirit of God breathed into them. And they uh, were raised up and became a mighty army. We looked at that strange and interesting painting from Madeira Europus Synagogue. And remember, this was a synagogue from the time after Christ. And so it, it helps us to understand that at, at that time, both before and after the time of Jesus Christ, there was a great interest among the people in the idea of the resurrection and the promise of the resurrection. And they they looked back to Ezekiel 37 uh, as a prophecy, and they they took that to heart, and they wondered when that was going to be fulfilled. Here's this little piece of Ezekiel 37. Then God said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. So Matthew understands the, the death of, of Christ and the subsequent resurrection of uh, these, these saints, he calls them, uh, to be a fulfillment of this prophecy from Ezekiel 37. The experience of resurrection from the dead was not something entirely new with Jesus. Sometimes people have the mistaken idea that the, the, the people of God, people of Israel, the Jewish people before the time of Jesus uh, didn't know anything about a resurrection, didn't believe in that. That's just not true. The writer of Hebrews uh, reminds us, and, he's, and remember, he's, he's talking here about people of the Old Testament, right? People before, long before, in some cases, the time of Christ. He's, he writes, what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Now listen, here's the real key verses. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might rise again to a better life. So the writer of Hebrews says, is very clear that the people before the time of Christ, these great heroes of faith who were waiting for uh, and trusting in God to fulfill his promises, that they experienced a real resurrection from the dead. And some had such strong faith in it that, you know, they uh, would not deny God, trusting that they would rise again to a better life. And so those are the, the, the people that are mentioned that Matthew talks about in chapter 27 as the saints, the, the, the holy ones, the, the righteous people, the believers, the, those who had trusted in God and his promises before the time of Christ. Many of them, not all of them, of course, but many of them were raised from the dead, he tells us, and they um, appeared in Jerusalem uh, to many people. You see, the... the uh, speculation, we might call it, or, or interest and, and curiosity in uh, the possibility of resurrection from the dead was something that was on the minds of the people. Uh, and we, we learn about that quite a bit in the intertestamental books, the books that were written uh, 
uh, but between after the time of Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, and uh, the first books of the New Testament. We have a Bible study here at Mount Olive for, uh, for, for quite a while now. Um, once a week we get together and we have been reading some of those books that were written. They're not in the Bible, but they were written during that time period, and they help us to understand where the people's thoughts were and uh, what was the religious scene and what were the hopes and the dreams of the people uh, before and during the time of Christ. And certainly they were hoping and wondering about the resurrection. Following Jesus' resurrection, we hear of other miraculous resurrections. Uh, you can look those up in Acts 9 and Acts 24. Um, Jesus gave his apostles the power to raise others from death. But the power that Jesus gave his apostles to raise the dead, we have to understand that served a far greater purpose. It was for the purpose of pointing to the new life that is given to those who hear and believe the saving gospel. So just as uh, Jesus' miracles, or John, the gospel writer, calls them his signs, because they were pointing to something far greater. Jesus wasn't just a miracle worker, some kind of a magician, and he didn't make his apostles uh, that either. But rather, in his miracles that he performed during his time on earth and the miracles that were performed by the apostles after him had this greater purpose of pointing to the new life that is given to those who hear and believe the saving gospel. Here's a, the question for us now. Can we expect to have an actual, a real, a historical experience of resurrection from the dead even now? I think the answer is a very definite yes. And why do I say that? Well, consider the following passages. Ephesians chapter 2. God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. St. Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here in his letter to the Ephesians, is talking about a, a very real experience of resurrection. You might say, oh, it was a spiritual resurrection, but it was more than that. It was a complete change in our condition, in our status, in our relationship with God. And because of that, a, a, a different relationship with life and death. Colossians goes on to explain it this way. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now, I want you to read this. Let's, let's look at this passage again a little more closely and kind of read it backwards, so to speak. Uh, because, it, because if we go to the, to the end of this passage, you know, chronologically, it's really kind of the first thing that happened. So, in other words, in verse 15, it explains what it was that Jesus accomplished in his death on the cross. It says he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And when did this happen, this victory that God won? Well, it was on the cross. Look at the previous verse, verse 
14. Canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So something significant happened when Jesus died on the cross. Not only were our sins forgiven, but also the rulers and authorities, those any power, any and every power that was uh, opposed to God was uh, disarmed, was defeated. And verse 13 now uh, explains that, that there was, that this victory of God affected us even before we existed, even before we knew anything about it. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses. So there it refers to uh, the resurrection, that God made us alive together with him. And when did that happen? That happened, as we've said, when Jesus died on the cross. And now uh, we get back to the first verse of this section, and it explains how this all um, comes to bear upon and is applied to our lives, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So by reading backwards this section of Colossians 2, we see how um, we are affected by, we are transformed by what Jesus accomplished in his death on the cross. So let's, re let's kind of review that. The cross is God's victory. The cross cancels the debt. Or like we have on our sign out in front of Mount Olive right now, the cross is the cure. People are looking for a cure for coronavirus. And God willing, um, we will find one soon. But the cross is the cure, the only cure for our sinfulness and for our separation from God. But the victory and the forgiveness that Christ accomplished uh, on his, in his death on the cross are applied to us. Baptism into his death and resurrection results in our resurrection to new life now. And so we can see that those saints of old who were raised from the dead um, at the time when Jesus died on the cross, they are kind of a symbol, we might say, um, of our resurrection through baptism into new life, and of course, our future resurrection with Christ, our physical bodily resurrection that we await as well. What God does in our baptism is no less miraculous than what he does in raising the dead at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, as we read about in Matthew 27, and afterwards, as we see in Acts and other places. In fact, these actual, real, historical resurrections are really lesser signs that point to a greater reality, and that greater reality is the new birth and new life of righteousness, which God grants in baptism. And so, going back to Colossians one more time, in the next chapter, Colossians 3, it says, If then you have been raised with Christ. Now look at how, that's, how that is said, right? You have been raised with Christ. Paul is saying, you know, you have, all, you, you have and, and, you, and you should experience a real resurrection uh, power in your life because you have been raised with Christ. When you understand and believe what Christ has done for you. So seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And then he goes on for several verses and describes exactly <laughs> what he's talking about what are those things that we are that we put to death because we have been brought to life and raised 
uh, to new life with Christ. And you can look those up and read the details for yourself. But then in, in verse 12, after talking about putting those wicked things to death, then he talks about the good things that, that we are to put on, the good things that are part of this resurrection life. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. That's what it means to be raised with Christ to new life. This is our present, our real, our actual, our historical experience of death with Christ and resurrection with Christ. It happens in our baptism and it happens in our daily baptism as we daily die uh, to sin with Christ and are raised with Christ to new life. St. Paul talks about it this way, and this is... I hope and pray that this is your desire, that this is your prayer as well. In fact, let's say it together as a prayer, shall we? I want to know Christ and the power that raised him from the dead. I want to share in his sufferings and become like him in his death. Then I have hope that I myself will be raised from the dead. Dear friends, may the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we give you our thanks and praise for all your goodness and your blessings to us each and every day. Especially in this time of fear and disease, Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes to see your blessings each and every day, and that you would open our hearts and help us to be generous and to share with those around us as we are given opportunity. Lord, we pray that you would provide for the needs of all. We pray that you would provide for the needs of your church, for the mission of your church, proclaiming salvation and life in Jesus' name. We ask that you would receive our offerings, Lord, from grateful and thankful hearts, and that you would multiply them greatly, Lord, for the work of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray together. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let us pray for the church, that the Lord would defend her against all her enemies and keep her true to Jesus Christ by the power of his word and spirit. Gracious Lord, Keep your scattered church in your mercy, that she may endure the assaults of the evil one and remain faithful for the sake of those numbered within your kingdom and those who have not yet heard the gospel and been brought to faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for all pastors, for all church work vocations, and for all the baptized in their vocation as God's people. Almighty God, by your Spirit you have gathered us as your church and promised that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in our midst. Do not allow stress or disaster to distract us from the particular vocations into which you have called us to serve in the church, home, and community. Grant to us every gift and blessing needful that we may honor our calling and serve you to the best of our ability. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Let us pray for those preparing for baptism, for the newly baptized, for those being catechized as children and adults, and for those joining our congregation. Almighty Father, your word will not return to you empty, but will accomplish your purpose. Hear us on behalf of those who have heard your word, who are being baptized into Christ and joining the fellowship of our congregation, that they may keep the faith with holy and joyful hearts trusting in Christ as their Savior. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for the government, for all in authority over us, and for our own lives as citizens and neighbors. Almighty Lord, you have established the kingdom of the left and hold accountable all those who govern in this and every place. Guide our president, the members of Congress, the governor of the state, and all who make, administer, and judge our laws, that they would serve nobly and wisely, pursuing the path of justice and protecting the citizens entrusted to them. Give them the wisdom and strength needed to bring our world out of crisis and back to stability. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for an end to violence and terror for those imprisoned, for the troubled in mind, and for those who suffer any afflictions of the body. Merciful Lord, your grace is sufficient for all our needs, and you have promised to be the strength of the weary, the hope of those who fear, the healing of the ill, the fullness of those disabled, and the peace of all who are distressed. Hear us on behalf of our nation and the world suffering pandemic and isolation. We pray especially 
for all those whom we name before you now in our hearts. May they be well supplied by your grace in every time of trouble. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for those not yet of the kingdom, that God would make us bold to speak the faith to them, and that hearing they might believe. Everlasting Father, it is your will that all should be saved and come to the knowledge of your Son by faith. Give to your word success and deliver from error all those who live in darkness and fear, that they may walk in the light of the Lord Jesus and have confidence for the trials of this world and hope for the world to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for the earth to be fruitful and for our good use of all the fruits of the earth. Blessed Lord, you give food to the hungry and provide for all our needs in this mortal life. Grant to us a grateful heart and knowledge to use wisely and well all that you have entrusted to our care. Bless those who work to make, prepare, deliver, or serve our daily bread, and give relief to those whose work has been halted. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, let us pray for our unity of doctrine and faith, and that we may soon be able to commune together upon Christ's body and blood. Holy Lord, as once your Son was welcomed with palms and hosannas, help us to welcome him who comes to us in the blessed sacrament of his body and blood. Guard us against false teaching and help us to discern truth from error that none may be led astray or lost from the fellowship of your Son. Look with kindness on us as we are separated from Holy Communion, and comfort us with your promises, especially that we are never distant from the mystical body of your Son, the communion of saints. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us bless the Lord. Shall not prove the gate to heaven. 
birthday this week to Amanda Scarrett and Grant Gable and Leona Shore. Many blessings uh, to all of you. We will uh, have our Holy Week services, uh, again, online services, Monday, Thursday. Um, it'll be the same service, but we'll uh, probably show it twice on Monday, Thursday, 10 a.m. and again at 7 p.m., Good Friday at 7 p.m. Our church directory, a, a revision of it is available, so stop by the office. Uh, for a copy. And uh, Lake Minnetonka Shores is looking for people to make masks, um, face masks. So if you're interested, uh, contact the church office here uh, for a pattern. Please uh, continue to keep in touch with each other and, and uh, let us know uh, here in the church office how we, can, uh, how we can help, how we can pray for you. And um, please reach out to your, to your neighbors. Uh, and share the love of Christ with them any way you can. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <clears throat>